This is a sample example, exam one. Problem one, a box contains 12 varieties of candy and exactly two pieces of each variety. If 12 pieces of candy are selected at random, what is the probability that a given variety is represented? This is sample exam one of eight, problem one. Here, n is 24, n is 12, so let's let x1 be a given variety. It can take on the values 0, 1, or 2, and x2 be all other varieties. We're asked to find the probability that x1 is greater than 1, which means x is 1 or it's x is 2. Well, we can take 1 minus those, 1 minus probability that x1 is 0 because that's the rest of the sample space and it makes it easier. So, um, in, after doing this calculation, you could probably skip from here to here, from to the uh, second asterisk, but we're going to go through the, my thought process. So to find the probability that x1 is 0, I introduce the x2 variable, but sum over all the possible values of x2. Now, an analogy to this is if I have two die, die 1 and, and die 2, and I want to find the probability that we roll a, a 5 on die 1, that is equal to the probability that we roll a 5 on die 1 and we roll a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 on die 2. So that's what I'm introducing here is when I sum over all possible values. But then you realize that we took a sample of size 12. So if x1 is 0, the only possibility that is x is 12. Well, this is a hypergeometric. And we want 2 from the first uh, out of x1, and we want 12 out of x2, and there's 22 choose 12, and the total sample is 24 choose 12. Then that reduces to this, reduces, and you get uh, 3, 35 over 46. And in retrospect, we probably could have skipped from here to here. Problem two, three people, X, Y, and Z, in order, roll a die. The first one to roll, an even number wins, and the game is ended. The probability that X will win is... So problem two is X, Y, and Z are going to roll in order. So I set up a, a sequence here. So uh, the subscript is signifies what role it was. So this is the first role, but it could stop at any time in here, as long as someone rolls an even number. Um, as long as they keep rolling an odd number, the game keeps playing. And we want to find the probability that X wins. So he could win on, X could win on the first roll, so the probability that it, we roll an even is one half. Now, we, it, he could win on a second roll, so we have to add the probability that he could win on his first time, or his second, his third, his fourth, and, it, and it's an infinite series. Um, and then we got to find a pattern, you know, that we could that we can sum. So the probability that that x rolls an even on the second roll, you know, given that x d and Y and Z on their first rolls rolled an odd. Now those events are independent, so we can break them all up. So this is the probability that X2 rolls an even on uh, that's X roll on a second roll is an even, and that is times the probability. And I introduced this pi notation because I'm going to introduce it in the next equation, but it goes from one to one, and so it's the probability that each of those roll an odd on their first roll. I equals one. So that's uh, one half is here, uh, one half to the third is for this one. And I'm going to rewrite it as one half to, uh, times one to the eighth. Now the probability that X wins on the third roll, meaning they roll an, an even, that, but that's also times the probability that, that X and Y and Z all roll an odd, that's an O, not a zero. And now all those are independent. 
So that's the probability that it rolls an even on the third roll, and it's the product of all those that they roll an odd. So that is, this is one half, and there's six of those, so it's one half to the sixth, and I'm going to rewrite it as this. So probability that we win on the fourth roll uh, times the probability that we don't win on the on the first three rolls of the, all the x, y, and z is one half to the ninth, and I'm going to rewrite it as this. And so the probability that x wins me is the probability to win on the first roll plus the probability that he, that x wins on the second roll, the third roll, the fourth roll, the da 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 da. Um, well, this is a looks like a geometric series here. So if we factor out a half, we get one plus one eighth to the first plus one eighth squared plus da 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 da, and that can be rewritten as this, which is uh, seven over four. Now another way to think about this, and I and if I have more than one solution, I'm gonna provide them all. Um, here, let's not think about. The pro let's not think about X winning. Let's think about someone winning on the ith roll. So um, it goes X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So the probability that someone wins on the ith roll is they have to roll an even, which is this. And then the I minus one previous rolls all have to be an odd. And they're all independent. So that's one half I minus one. Well, if we note that X rolls on the first roll, the fourth, the seventh, the tenth, etc., then we can create a uh, this probability. So this is the probability that, that we went on the first roll. This is the probability we went on the fourth roll. This is the probability, oh, that should be a one. The probability we went on the seventh roll well, this ends up being the same uh, geometric series here, and it reduces to 7 fourths. Problem 3. A student received a grade of 80 in math final, where the mean grade was 72 and the standard deviation was S. In the statistics final, he received a 90, where the mean grade was 80 and the standard deviation was 15. If the standardized scores, i.e. the scores adjusted to the mean of zero and standard deviation of one, were the same in each case, then S equals... Here is uh, exam one of eight, problem three. Here we said that the scored an 80 and the mean was 72 with the standard deviation. On the statistics score, there was a score of 90, mean of 80, and a standard deviation, 8. He said the z-scores were equal, so you set them equal, you solve for s, and the standard deviation would be 12. Number four, three boxes identical in appearance contain the following coins. Box X contains two quarters. Box Y contains one quarter, two dimes. Box Z, one quarter, one dime. If a coin drawn at random from a box selected at random is a quarter, what is the probability that the randomly selected box contains at least one dime? So problem four, it's a little bit trickier here. Here, we're going to let B be the random box that's chosen. It could be an X, Y, or Z. And we're going to let D be that there's at least one dime in the box and Q be a quarter drawn from the box. So the probability that we're interested in is the probability that there's a dime in the box given that we drew a quarter. Now that can be rewritten as the, um, the product of D comma Q divided by probability of Q. And we want to look at each of these individually. So let's look at the probability that we draw a quarter and that's going to be up here. So now to do this, we introduce that uh, an extra variable. So we introduce B. So the probability that we draw a quarter and it's from box I, but I goes from X, Y, and Z. So it, it could be any of those. 
So we don't change this probability. Well, we do that because this uh, uh, intersection here, Q and B, can be rewritten as a conditional probability. Probability of Q given box I times the probability of box I. Well, once we know what box we're talking about, then we can figure out the probability of drawing a quarter. So when I is X, so we're at box X, the probability of drawing a quarter is 1. And the probability that we drew box X is 1 third. So then we add that to the, the probability that, that we draw a quarter given box Y is 1 third. Probability we draw box Y is 1 third. Now, probably we draw a quarter given box Z is a half times probability that we're in box, probably we draw a box Z is one third. So that equals uh, 11 18 So now this joint um, distribution here, D comma Q. So it's a probability that we, there's a dime in the box and we draw a quarter. So again, we introduce a, the, we, we add a variable here, b, and we sum over all the outcome, x, y, and z. So this doesn't change that probability. But here we can change it into a conditional probability. So given box b, and then we have to take it times probably a drawn box b. Well, then we know these probabilities. The probability that there's a dime in the box and we draw a quarter, given box x, well, that's zero because there's no dime in the box. And so that's probably one third. So given that we're at box Y, the probability we draw a dime and a quarter is one third. This is one third. Probability we draw, a, there's a dime in the box, we draw a quarter. Given box Z is one half and then times one third. So that's five eighths. So now we take those and plug them back in. So we have five eighteenths over eleven eighteenths, which is five elevenths. Problem five, for a Poisson distribution f of x in which f of zero equals two times f of one, what is the probability that x is greater than or equal to two? So here, um, probability five, we're given that it's a Poisson distribution, and this is the density of a Poisson, but we don't know the lambda values, the parameter, but they, they do give us this relationship. So if we plug in zero for X and here we plug in one for X, but we keep the two times it, then we can solve for lambda and that's one half. So we're tasked with the probability that X is greater than two, but a Poisson is infinite. So that's X is two, three, four, five, all the way to infinity. So what's pretty common in these exams is realizing that you could take one minus, one minus everything else, which is zero and one, and that equals this. So you have to understand that in, to do a lot of these tests. Well, the probability that X equals one is, is, uh, is one half times probably X equals zero factored out. X, probably the x is zero, just plug in a zero into this equation when lambda is a half, and we get this. Problem six. If P and Q are events having positive probability in the sample space S such that their intersection is the null set, then all of the following pairs are independent except for... Now, number six is um, what uh, these are all independent except for what? Now remember independence means that you can take their joint probability and factor it into the product of the marginal. So here if we look at the probability and these are each of the provide an answer so we'll go through them. So the probability that the empty set intersect P is and well that intersection is the empty set and the probability empty set is zero and that's equal to zero times you know any probability but let's just put p well that is equal to this marginal so those two events are independent and we can do something very similar to the probability of the null intersect p complement 
it can be rewritten as the product of their individuals. So that's independent. The probability that P intersect S, well, that intersection, S is the whole sample space. So it, it, we just get P back. Well, P times one is still P, but the probability of the whole sample space is one. So these can be rewritten as the product. Now here we have the product, uh, the probability of P intersect P intersect Q. Um, well, this is a smaller set than this. So that intersection, we just get this back. But we're saying in the, they said those were disjoint, which that's zero. Well, if this is zero right here, then we could take it times anything and it's still zero. Well, that shows that those two events are independent. Well, here, now the probability of P intersect Q, we know that's zero, but we're given, so can we write that as a probability of P times probability of Q? Well, we're given that those are non-zero, they're positive. So the product of two non-zero numbers is always not zero, so it can't ever equal that. So P and Q are not necessarily independent. So the answer is B. Problem seven. An ordinary die is converted into a biased die in which the probability that a given number of dots appears is proportional to the number of dots. And it, in six independent throws of this die, what is the probability that each face appears exactly once? So here, problem seven, where an ordinary die is converted into a biased die, and we want to find the probability that in six rolls, um, each number is represented once. So let's let xi be the number we observe on the ith roll. But as a re reminder, that it's a biased die. So if we let J be one through six, the probability that we roll that number is equal to J over 21. So J is the normalizing constant. So though all those probabilities add to one. Now let's look at a specific case here. Um, you know, this isn't the exact probability, but it's gonna get us there. Let's just assume that we roll a, a one on the first roll, and then a two on the second, and a three and a four and a five, and a six on the sixth roll. Well, those prop, remember X1, X2 through X6 are independent. So that's just the product of those individual probabilities. Well, you multiply the numerator and you get six factorial and you multiply the denominators, you get 21 over six. So now um, that is just one ordering of the, the possibilities one through six. So how many ways can we reorder one through six? Well, that's six factorial. So there's, and each of those have the same probability of appearing. So the probability that each face appears once is six factorial times the probability of any one of those events. So that's six factorial squared divided by 21 to the sixth. Problem eight. A study was conducted on 400 families, each having exactly three children, to determine whether or not boy and girl births were equally likely. The following results were obtained. Number of boys, the number of 400 families that had zero boys, it was 65. The number of the 400 families with one boy was 40. Two boys, 148. Three boys, 47. What is the value of chi-squared, and are the results significantly different from those expected at the 0 0.05 level? So exam eight, um, it asks for a chi-squared test statistic, and this is it. So xi is what we observe, and this is what is expected. So, and that has a limiting distribution of a chi-squared uh, with k minus one degrees of freedom. And we're summing k different groups. So if we let x be the number of boys out of three births, x is a binomial, n equal to three p to the one half. And this is a binomial density, or 
Yeah, or sometimes probability mass function. So let's find the probability of, that we have zero boys out of three. That's one eighth. Probability that we have one is three eighths, two is three eighths, one is one eighth. So now we have um, we have to plug these into our chi squared. So the first category zero we we observe sixty five. Now, what's the pro what do we expect to see out of 400 families? We expect to see one-eighth of those have zero boys. And you square that quantity divided by what we expect. So here in category, you know, we the families that observed one boy out of three was 140. We would expect to see uh, out of the 400 families, three-eighths of them have just one boy. Same there. And then... This is uh, two boys, and this is three boys. So after that calculation, we get uh, chi-squared is equal to 5.37. The cutoff value, now my table is accumulative from, you know, so um, this is only a right tail test, so I, I want the 95% to the left. And we're dealing with uh, three degrees of freedom. There's the, the cutoff region. And the test is not significant. Problem nine. A random sample of nine observations from a normal population yields the observed statistics x bar equal five and one over eight times that sum is equal to 36. What are the 95% confidence limits for mu? So question nine is we have a sample from a, a normal distribution. Now I want to point something out. So if uh, to standardize a normal, the, the X bar, this is a standard normal. I'm going to give you a little background on this statistic here. Now chi-squared, well, if we let X squared equal this, that's a chi-squared with N minus one degrees. And that, that says that the sample variance can be modeled as a chi-squared. And the t-statistic is a standard normal over the square root of a chi-squared divided by its degrees of freedom. That's a t-distribution. That's the definition of it. And if we look at this relationship here, so we take this z divided by that x, you know, the square root, etc. we come up with this. So that's a t-distribution. So if we plug this into this probability statement, where this is from the t, t distribution with eight degrees of freedom, tail area is 0.05, and here the right tail is, I mean, 0.25. The right tail area here is 0.025, which means a cumulative 0.975. That is a 95% confidence interval. So now if we multiply this quantity to both sides, subtract x bar to both sides and then that negative we're going to have to multiply times negative one throughout we come up with this and it's still equal to 0.95 um well this value and this value are equal because the t to t distribution is symmetric so we can just pick one of those and i just picked t sub 0.025 so this is a 95% confidence interval, and if we plug in the values, th there is our answer.